Okay, I'm here today with Roger Igo. He's the president and CEO of the Bell Tower Group LLC, uh, one of their their major businesses, the uh, the Bell Tower on 34th in Houston, Texas. So, Roger, welcome. It's great to have you on the show. Hello. Yes, thank you for having me. I appreciate you having me as a guest. I'm honored. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, Roger, why don't you uh, just give us a, a quick little overview of yourself, your career, how you ended up uh, uh, where you are here with the uh, Bell Tower Group LLC. Sure. So I came on board in 2009. And um, so I'm the CEO of the leading location hosting weddings and special events in the number one market, which is kind of a, a mouthful. We do weddings primarily three out of four events that we do are weddings. Um, and so we do a very high volume of weddings here at our location. And we also um, own and operate several other brands, um, which I, which I'm in charge of. Outstanding. So. Outstanding. So it's not just the venue. You've also got a, a number of other, a number of other diversified uh, business. What are the kind of things you are, 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 is your group into? So we have uh, another website called venuesinhouston.com, and that's where we have, it's basically an index of venues that allow third-party caterers. We also have a catering brand. Excellent Events is our catering brand. We also have some technology. There is a proposal estimating software that we use that's industry-specific. Industry we also have customerhubportal.com, which is another industry specific product that we offer. Um, we also operate a charity. It's keepongoing.org, which is 100% uh, of the proceeds from my book and other donations go directly to the Alzheimer's Foundation. Um, and so those, those are some of our primary brands that we that I operate. Roger, that's absolutely outstanding. So, so you said three out of four uh, of your of your uh, events or weddings, so so how many weddings are you doing a year right now? I mean, it's it's post pandemic world. What what does that look like for you? So currently, we have we we have two hundred and ten weddings in our pipeline uh, booked, and that means two hundred and ten events that are going to be in the future um, that we're currently preparing for. Um, when we do the look back a year from now, we will have delivered three hundred weddings. It's just because of fill in events throughout that same time frame. So other than weddings, we do non-bridal events. Those might be the during the week corporate events. Those might be uh, December holiday parties. Um, so that is more or less the ratio of our operation. So I know the world has heard the narrative about what happened to hospitality during the pandemic, but uh, let's talk about your property specifically. Uh, you know, what, what did business look like during the pandemic for you? And, and you know, how have you come out of it? So we did have a government shutdown where we were not allowed to operate. I still came in and worked in my office, but we had just completed a remote, you know, our network and our computer settings and our laptops and everything. We had just established and deployed a new communication process where everyone could work remotely easily. So when the pandemic hit, we were ready, but it wasn't because we it was just kind of by accident. We shut down. Um, we did have a reopening where it was a graduated opening of a certain percentage from 25% to 50%. And then, you know, just kind of gradually increased. In our state, in Texas, the governor opened um, incrementally. And it was really that of those weddings that we had. The clients were either one of two. They either said, are you crazy? We, we're absolutely having our wedding. Uh, if you can have the wedding, we want to have the wedding. And then we had the other group of, are you crazy? Absolutely, we are not having our wedding. So there were some reschedules. But of those, of those clients that wanted to continue forward and have their event, the guest sizes were, they were self-limiting. In other words, the client, um, and their guests that were invited uh, either opted in or opted out because I, I'm thinking that their guests also had the same thought. Are you crazy? I wouldn't miss it. Or are you crazy? Absolutely not coming. So the guest, si the guest count sizes were smaller 
and they were small enough that they would fit within the limitations of the government regulations at the time. So we were able to operate. We were 1,500 guest count is our maximum. So based on the maximum capacity, 25% of 1,500 was still uh, plenty of room uh, for the people who still wanted to have their event in those days. So we were able to operate and, and provide services for the for the clients that wanted to move forward with their event. That's outstanding. I mean, I know a lot of uh, businesses, you know, they, they took the closure and then really had a hard time ramping up out of it. But it sounds like your team had a, a great plan and and a, a great way to be able to execute, uh, even with changing uh, business demand and changing volume. So uh, kudos to you. And, and obviously, it's paying off for uh, obviously all of these events that you have scheduled and ready on the books. Yes, thank you. I, I think we're really at a point now, post pandemic, where we have, I, I look at future revenue, I look at current bookings, I look at uh, year, year annual comparison, year on year comparison. And it's easy to see that based on historical data, we really are normalized, uh, except for the non bridal business. So I'd say the bridal business is back, the non bridal business is still running at about 50%. And, and I think we're seeing that in a lot of places right now where the leisure market is roaring back and, and it's almost hard to, to keep a hold of. And then, you know, obviously everybody's waiting for that corporate business to, to kick back in and be as robust as it used to be, uh, you know, which was something you could set your watch by. Yeah, true. Wonderful. Well, you know, so your venue is uh, independent venue. Is that right? Yeah, we don't have uh, a... A, a corporate brand or a national brand we're a local brand or regional and so we we run things a little bit differently perhaps than some of the larger uh chains or the larger franchises do so that was one of the things that you and i had talked about right so you have an independent brand um you're diversified very well but uh you know obviously a lot of people wearing a lot of hats to make it happen so one of the things you focused on was operational excellence, not only during the pandemic, but prior to and now post-pandemic, especially with staffing being what it is right now. What kind of what kind of approach are you taking to be able to create some of those operational efficiencies with, within your organization? Well, so our goal is to deliver excellent events no one will ever forget. And we really do train our team members to follow that mantra and that rule. So if you are in a situation when you, uh, maybe there's a time compression and you need to make a decision without time to go ask your supervisor, then you can use that as your guidepost. Um, is this so that we can deliver an excellent event no one will ever forget, yes or no? And if the answer is no, then don't do it. If the answer is yes, then I'll back you as, you know, as your president of the company um, and I can support you. So we focus on self-directed teams and that is one of our philosophies is departmental. Departmentally, we want each team to be able to operate independently. We do set forth policies and procedures and standardized processes that are able to help carry the team through so they have some basic framework. But we try to give them the freedom to operate and run within their independent department um, so long as what they're doing is in alignment with the overall goal of delivering an excellent event. Um, but that said, we do have, um, we work every day very hard and very diligently on moving forward, um, streamlining our, our processes. You know, we're, we're a 12 year old organization. And so in the early days, it was, it was chaos. And so we have focused on creating processes or systems that help address, you know, in the early days, it was really the big problems. And over time, we have fine-tuned it to where we're now working through 10-year-old problems and they either they're very, very hard to come up with a sustainable process or procedure that will be self-sustaining over years that can run without deviation, without management, um, or it's just down to the nitty-gritty like we're, we're you know, we're splitting hairs at this point with some of these new policies and procedures. So good, good enough, great policies. An example would be like lost and found. Gosh, every Monday morning, we have just a flood of phone calls from people that lost and found. So this was one of the early processes when we, when we started to tackle these. 
hey, let's come up with a, an easy system or process for all of the lost and found. So, you know, hey, here's a link on the website. Here is the lost and found room or the lost and found bin. This is the process for when staff finds an item that's been left behind. So we just created a whole e uh, ecosystem surrounded, surrounding that mm, drama. And so it, it, was, it, it, it freed up our team to work on something else because it was really quicksand. We call it quicksand or a time suck. And so that's really our approach for each thing. And my, my uh, signal is whenever there's drama, then that's, that's our team's job. That is our signal to go in and create. It's either a missing process or, or broke, broken process or missing process owner. Um, and and uh, so then that's when we go into action to try to create a self-sustaining long-term long solution that can, that can um, be put into place without deviation. And that's really the hard part because we never want to put a rule and then have all these exceptions to the rule because that's, that's just, uh, that in itself is a time suck. So we try, to, we try to come up with solutions like that. So that's something that I'm passionate about. Our team is passionate about. It's just a philosophy of continuous improvement. Um, which all contribute to operational efficiency and operational um, excellence. So that's, that's what I'm passionate about. That's what we work on every day. And because of that, we are able to have more, uh, you know, contributes to balance, work-life balance, uh, and also workload and customer satisfaction and profitability and all of those other things. So that's, that's, uh, that's something that I love, and that, that's what our team works on every day. So, you know, obviously, uh, uh, you know, operational excellence is, is hugely important right now. And, and a key factor of that is empowerment. Uh, you know, your team obviously has to be, as you discussed, uh, empowered to want to own the situation. What kind of things are you doing to get your leaders in that mindset uh, or just your team in that mindset that they are part of the process improvement, not just part of the process? Oh yeah, so we do have uh, we we in our our technology stack we use Microsoft Teams, similar to Slack or some other communication platforms that are out there. So we have different channels. One of the channels that we have, for example, is the uh, maintenance channel. Somebody sees somebody sees uh, you know a, a light bulb out, they're able to post that to the management uh, the the maintenance channel. And the guys that are on that channel are instantly notified and they can go into action to go change the light bulb right away. So it is just empowering staff to, and letting them know, giving them the tools such as this uh, communication tool to, to let them know that um, they have you know, an outlet to communicate to the rest of the team when there's, there are issues. So we have different issue channels but really, the, the, the biggest challenge, and it was a challenge, it's not so much anymore, is getting staff to have the, uh, to take ownership of themselves, of their coworkers, of their department, of the venue, of the company. And uh, so that has been, uh, that, that has been really what has gotten us through the pandemic. It's helped us keep our quality of service up, the morale in the company. And what that is, is just let, helping them, letting them know that we, we back them, we've got their back. Um, and also to encourage them to follow their dreams. You know, by, you know, by the time clock area, we have a giant blackboard and we call it the dream board. And so what we say is a, because nobody ever grew up, most of our team is our, our students. A lot of them are students. Um, nobody ever grew up saying one day I want to be a part of the wait staff at the bell tower. You know, they all have other things they want to do in life. And some of them are students going to school. Some of them are, this is their other job. Some of them have families they're trying to support. So, you know, so for whatever reason, so on the dream board, you know, and I always tell them it's a goal that's not written down. It's just a dream. So we, we have this dream board where staff, they come in and they write down what their dream is. 
And so it has a pretty big effect because they know that we all are supporting them and whatever their overall, what their long-term goals are. So we help them with school. We help them achieve. My favorite one was the guy, because invariably we have to reset the dream board. So he put, my dream is to become a pilot. I mean, the kid was like 17 years old, 18, go, you know, and he, my dream is to be a pilot. Well, he'd worked for us for, I think, four or five years. Well, now he's a pilot. But it was just getting to getting to where every time we reset the board, he was the first one to go right on the dream board. I want to be a pilot to help, you know, fill up the board with their dreams. And so everybody on, on his team and in the company, when they go see everybody, some want to be politicians or they want to be the next Elon Musk or they want to be an astronaut or a pilot or, you know, they want to be a nurse. Or, so we help them and they, we, we just embrace the fact that this, this waitstaff job is you're passing through. Now, some of them went to school to be an engineer and now they graduated and they're still working here um, as part of our team. So they feel like it's a part of a family. Um, they, so as they do that, they take ownership and they, they support their coworkers. We also do things like if you're in college and you give me your report card, you get $50 for every A. You send us a referral, somebody would give you a hundred bucks if, they, if they're here after 90 days. Um, you know, you can do your homework here. You can do your laundry here while you do your homework. Um, we do outings, we do company Christmas parties. We do um, one time we rented out a movie theater and watched a cool movie. I mean, so we do things like that too, to help with uh, getting them, you know, support them. You, we find if, you, if we support them, they support us. So that's a good, that's a good feeling. So I, everything you just said, a, first of all, absolutely amazing. I, I don't ever tell my daughter, my daughter that you pay $50 for an A or else I'm going to go broke. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I think this is at the heart of what everybody's talking about right now is that work can't just be work, right? You talk about operational excellence, but at the same time, you're asking people what they want to be and what their dreams are. And you're not afraid to help them get there. And, and I yeah. think that's got to be hugely powerful for people to know that, uh, you know, you're a waiter at an event. Your boss knows that you want to be a pilot. He's not afraid of helping you get there, understanding that you won't come back. But at the same time, there are all these amazing things that you're doing to keep it engaged and keep it exciting and keeping people wanting to be there, giving them the empowerment, giving them the growth. 95% of every article I read right now is saying that the, the way to stop the great resignation is basically everything that you're doing right now. So uh, kudos that's to you great. and your leadership team. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's outstanding. Yeah. So Daniel, who's the pilot now, he's, he's a cheerleader for our company, even though he's moved on and he is now a pilot. He, if he runs into some up and coming person or friend or family member or teammate who has kids or something, Hey, you know what, after you graduate or while you're putting yourself through college, you really should look into this place because that's where I went and they'll help you achieve what you want to, you know, you want to achieve in life and, and pay you during that time too. So that's, that's outstanding. I, I love the fact that you have, uh, you have almost institutionalized growth and, and institutionalized that, that focus on what's next, even if you're, not part of that next, but you're, you're able to, you're able to really capitalize on the now and, and, and keep people focused. That's, that's outstanding. That's hugely, hugely core, I think, to what our industry needs in general to be able to retain people and be able to grow our workforces. We can't just be afraid to lose people. We have to focus on growth and we have to be able to bring them along. That's outstanding. Yeah. I was just listening to Robert Kiyosaki, one of the, uh, one of the top rules, one of the top five rules of money, intelligence, financial intelligence. If you want something, give it. So, you know, if you want employees, support the employees and they will get, they will give back to you more than, than you gave to them. And it's, it's just uh, that, you know, it's one of the reasons we promote other venues. We send business to other venues on, on in another brand that that I operate, and so that's that. You know, if it's not a fit here, let me help you find a place. 
and they seem to really appreciate that. So oh, that's great. That's great. Now, you know, when you first started talking, you mentioned uh, a book, right? Keep on going uh, is the book that you wrote. Is that correct? Yeah, keep on going. I have a copy right here. Keep on going. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, usually what I do is ask people for a piece of advice for somebody coming up in the industry, but you know, you've already written a book about a piece of advice. So, so tell me what the, the theme or the message is about the book, uh, you know, for when people go out and buy it. So the, the message of the book, keep on going is just that keep on going. And it's about fortitude. It's, it did come out pre pandemic, but it really does have a message of stick to it and you will accomplish what you need to accomplish or what you're never give up, have, have grit, stick to it. And that's what the book keep on going is about. It is, you know, you can accomplish anything if you set your mind to it um, and have a little faith and pray about it and uh, it will come, it will come to you. So that's really the message of the book. That's, that's outstanding. I think everybody needs to hear a little bit of that right now, right? Is, you know, stick to it, keep on going. Uh, you know, this is all going to get better and you're going to be better for it on the other side, right? That's right. That's exactly right. And so you've, you've evolved this book into a foundation as well, right? We do. It's, uh, it's, we raise money. All of the proceeds from the book go to alzheimers.org. It's the Alzheimer's Foundation. Um, that's, that's not my foundation. It's the Alzheimer's Foundation. But um, all of the proceeds, 100% of every penny goes directly to, well, it comes to me from the publisher, and then I send it to Alzheimer's. But we also raise money. We donate other funds to the Alzheimer's Foundation. It is because our goal is to deliver excellent events that no one will ever forget. And Alzheimer's is the enemy of mem remembering things. And so we want everything we do to be memorable. And uh, Alzheimer's, there needs to be a cure. So that's, that's what that's about. That's so give to Alzheimer's.org. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, absolutely. You know, let's, let's make sure that, uh, uh, you know, and this is a great, great time to ask, you know, Roger, how do people find out more about you? How do people find out more about keep on going about your foundation? How do we, how do we learn more about all of that? Uh, so there's Roger Igo.com R O G E R I G O.com. Um, and then there's probably links on some of our other online assets as well, but uh, very simply, if you go to rogerigo.com, you can find all of the different brands, some of our investments that are, uh, that are cool, and um, the, the brands I manage, as well as a link to the book, and uh, even some of the articles that I've written that are, that are published out there in the blogospheres. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, Roger, I think after this, you're probably going to get quite a few uh, reach outs, not only to hear more about, uh, you know, keep on going uh, to hear more about your unique venue. Um, but I think a lot of people are going to be very interested in, you know, how you're uh, leading your team, how you're empowering your team, how you're growing your team, how you're turning operational excellence into uh, into a culture that kind of fits everything that people are looking for right now. So, uh, you know, expect to see some reach outs and everything. So, uh, Roger, I, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for, for giving me your time today and, and uh, look forward to catching up with you again. Yes, thank you very, very much. I'm honored to be with you today, and I really do appreciate you having me on. Awesome, Roger. Well, until the next time.